Degenerative spinal changes affect 95% of people over the age of 50. You may be struggling with spinal stenosis and doing all the wrong things. Today, we're gonna to be discussing the signs of spinal stenosis, activities you should be avoiding, and what you should be doing if you believe you're struggling with spinal stenosis. First off, what is spinal stenosis? So the definition of spinal stenosis is a narrowing in the canal that the spinal cord goes through, or it can also be in the facet joints, which is where the nerves come out from the spinal cord. You see you have the seven cervical vertebrae, which are your neck. You have 12 thoracic vertebrae, which are your rib cage and your mid back. And then you have the five lumbar vertebrae that make up your low back. Now, all of these vertebrae are stacked on top of each other and the spinal cord goes through a hole that runs all the way through these vertebrae. This hole can get smaller due to things like inflammation or abnormal bony changes, and this can cause a spinal stenosis. The nerves from the spinal cord come out at each level of the vertebrae. The nerves exit through a canal that's called the facet joint. This facet joint can also have bony overgrowth or inflammation or scar tissue that can narrow the canal, putting increased stress on the nerve root at that level. Now, technically, spinal stenosis is when there is a narrowing in the canal that the spinal cord sits in. So that would be in the central or in the spine. However, I have seen more recently on MRI reports that if there is narrowing in the facet joint, they are also calling this spinal stenosis. So I include it here, although I would believe traditionally it was when it was in the spinal column itself. The reason why this is important is because if it's in a facet joint or affecting one nerve root, you're going to have symptoms along that nerve root. Whereas if it's more centrally located, you may have more symptoms in like both legs or both arms or in multiple areas at one time. Your symptoms will be the same symptoms, however, it will be affecting a different region and that gets confusing for some people. So what are the common symptoms of spinal stenosis? The first one is that you'll have pain and most commonly it'll be in both arms or both legs. After the onset of the pain, you may also start to have some numbness, which means you don't have as good of sensation in the more distal regions, including your hands or your feet, depending on if it's your arms or your legs. Often that will be followed by a tingling or a sensation like your hands or feet have fallen asleep. And usually that numbness and tingling will start in the further areas, such as the hands and the feet. If this continues to progress, you may start to feel some weakness and it's a slow development of the weakness over time. This is not a situation where all of a sudden you have weakness. It slowly develops over time and you start to wonder, is it just because I'm not moving as much because of all the other symptoms or is it truly a weakness? And it can be hard to really ascertain that weakness because it is slowly developing over time. It's one of those things that people most often when they come into my clinic, I ask them if they have weakness and they're like, no, I don't think I have any of that. But when we do that muscle testing, they start to realize like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm not as strong as I used to be. So most people have these symptoms intermittently here and there, but they don't know that they have spinal stenosis until they've progressed to that point of it being extremely painful or they have that extreme weakness. So I had a patient who came in to see me one time and he had been struggling with some pain, some weakness, some tingling, kind of these intermittent symptoms, but it had been going on for years and it was starting to progress. So he initially went to see his doctor who diagnosed him with the spinal stenosis. And then he went to see another physical therapist who gave him some nonspecific exercises. And actually those exercises increased his pain more than helped them. So this gentleman was super skeptical when he walked into my clinic because he had already been to the doctor who wasn't able to do anything for the symptoms. He had already been to physical therapy, which actually increased the symptoms. And so during his discovery visit, we had to talk about what was it that he was doing exercise wise. And actually when I looked at all of his exercises, they were all potentially increasing the symptoms of his spinal stenosis. It made sense why they were causing him pain. 
So during that free discovery visit, I asked him to stop doing all of those exercises. I gave him some ideas of things that he could be doing that would help his symptoms. And we also scheduled that evaluation to understand how this spinal stenosis was affecting him. Because you see, one of his biggest concerns was that he had gone to see these beautiful gardens. And when he walked, he could not walk for very long because that's when the numbness would really start in his legs. And it was like the, the nummy, painy, like I can't move forward and he would start shuffling and he just felt really old. And so what would happen when he was at the garden is he would kind of walk from bench to bench. Luckily the garden had a ton of benches, but that's not exactly what he wanted to do. And although this gentleman was older at the time, he did not like the idea of feeling old. So when we did the evaluation, we did of course notice the spinal stenosis, but we were able to observe what motions were most painful for him, as well as if there were any compounding issues. In his case, one of the compounding issues was that his hips were really, really tight. So in addition to that spinal stenosis, when he was walking, he didn't have full hip motion. So then that was putting increased stress on his back as well. So for his treatment plan, what we actually did, because we can't actually cure the spinal stenosis, most commonly that's a bony overgrowth, and there's nothing I can do about bones. I mean, even as a physical therapist, if there's a bony overgrowth, I can't change that. However, I can change how your body is interacting with that. By getting his hips moving better and bringing back his strength in his legs and his core, he was able to maintain a better posture so that walking didn't bother him. In fact, after that, he was able to go back to all of his yard work. He lives on some acreage, so yard work is a really big thing for him, as well as all the building projects he had going on at home. And it was really cool to help him transition from feeling like an old man who was shuffling around to getting back to doing all the yard projects and the home projects and the traveling that he wanted to be able to do. Now, did I cure the spinal stenosis? No, I already told you, I can't do that. However, I did change how his body was interacting with that so that he was able to get the outcomes that he was looking for. So how should you treat your spinal stenosis? Well, it really depends on what is causing it in the first place. You see, most commonly, it can be that bony overgrowth, but that developed over time, and most likely you didn't have symptoms all along that time. So what is it in your body that has changed that has caused the symptoms to now produce at this point. Also, you could have some disc issues that are putting increased pressure on the spinal cord and causing your symptoms of spinal stenosis. So then the question is, what can we do to help that disc in order to help decrease your symptoms and get you back to moving? We also base our treatment on if there is numbness and tingling, and if there is, exactly how far it's traveling. So for many people, when they start having a numbness or tingling issue, it will start, let's say it's in, it's in their upper extremities, so their hands and arms, it'll usually start in their upper arm, and then eventually it'll travel past the elbow, and then eventually it'll go into the hand. So I've had some people come in who are wondering if they have a carpal tunnel syndrome or if they have a spinal stenosis because they have numbness and tingling in both hands. And the differential for that is, do you only have numbness and tingling in your hands or do you have some numbness and tingling in the forearm or even in the upper arm or somewhere in the neck and shoulders? Now, to be fair, sometimes it is so bad in the hands that they're not able to notice everything else. But usually when I ask that question, they're able to say, oh, well, I used to have this, but now it's really bad in my hands. Whereas with carpal tunnel syndrome, most people know because it is the numbness and tingling and the pain is all in their hands. It's increased with using the computer or with working, and they have a history of using a computer regularly throughout the day. Treatment is also based on the severity and the frequency of your symptoms. Unfortunately, many people do not seek help until it is their hands or their feet that are numb and tingly, until they're shuffling around or not able to pick up a coffee cup or something simple like that, because before that, they hope that these symptoms will just go away on their own. But 
when your symptoms have gotten that bad, it becomes really important that we deal with those symptoms first, because whenever we have nerve symptoms, whenever the nerve is irritated, we have to deal with that first because that takes the longest to heal. Your nerves are capable of healing, but it does take longer than let's say a muscle, which is usually pretty quick to heal or a ligament and tendon, which takes a little bit longer than a muscle, but less time than a nerve. So the treatment plan for spinal stenosis should be based on all of these different issues, which includes the cause of spinal stenosis, the location of your current symptoms, the severity and frequency of your symptoms, as well as your goals for treatment. Once all of those pieces of the puzzle are put into place, then it becomes pretty easy to form a treatment plan that is specific for you and your body. I can tell you and guarantee two things. The first, if your signs of spinal stenosis have been going on for years, it is going to take a while in order to be able to treat them. I do not know any healthcare provider who is a magician who can simply eliminate your spinal stenosis symptoms overnight if they've been going on for years. Which leads to my second point. If you're seeing a healthcare provider for your spinal stenosis symptoms, you need to be looking at all these different factors. What is causing this problem, how long you've had it, the severity and the frequency of your symptoms, as well as what your goals are. If that's not all considered as part of your plan to get you back to the things that you wanna do, you may be going down the wrong path. You may be doing exercises that are not appropriate for you because the root cause has not been determined or you may be doing exercises that are not appropriate for you because they're not getting you back to what you want to be able to do it's really important to work with a specialist who's going to look at your entire story up to this point do a complete evaluation and understand how other tissues are affecting your spinal stenosis in order to come up with a plan to meet your goals so then when should you seek help if you have neck or low back pain that is lasting more than 7 to 14 days, I would highly recommend you seeking help from a specialist to understand what the root cause of that is. Because chances are, if it goes away even after 14 days, it's going to come back in the future if the root cause is not addressed. Now, if you're struggling with numbness and tingling anywhere in your body, but especially in your feet or your hands, I recommend you seeking out treatment immediately. As I mentioned earlier, those nerves take longer to heal than any other tissue in your body. So you wanna make sure you're getting on top of that just as quickly as possible because you wanna reverse whatever it is that's causing that problem to get those nerves started on their healing journey. All right, now it's over to you. If you have been diagnosed with spinal stenosis, what have you done that has been helpful? Let's help give some tips and ideas to the rest of our community, as well as things that they should know about or avoid.